Thanks everyone for uh, joining the second panel of today of the Public Play, Play, Play Space uh, Symposium. Uh, so the panel uh, is uh, entitled Interactive and Community-Based Strategies for Co-Design of Public Space. Um, my name is Matilde Marengo and I'm Head of Studies at IAC. Um, I will be moderating this panel together with Davide Leone from CLAC. So I'll just quickly introduce myself and Davide. Um, and then we'll go on to the first uh, presentation. Um, so as I was saying, I'm Head of Studies at IAC. Um, I'm a PhD architect uh, in my PhD was actually in urbanism and my research focuses around uh, the contemporary urban phenomena, um, its integration with technology and its implications on the future of our planet. Um, so in that sense, uh, and within today's critical environment, uh, I investigate the responsibility of designers in uh, answering some of the uh, bigger challenges that we face today. Uh, as I was saying, I'll be moderating this panel together with Davide Leone from CLAC. Uh, he's an architect and a researcher with a PhD in urban and regional planning, um, and he's the founder of Ugain. Uh, his main interests are directed towards social issues of the city, in particular the multi-ethic dimension and the city representation tools um, that are intended as communication protocols for non-traditional urban planning processes. Uh, so with no further ado, I will call uh, to present our first uh, paper. Um, Maria Tome Nunez, uh, Nunez sorry, will be presenting, or Maria Tome. Um, she'll be presenting a paper which is called What is Playmaking? the power of video games to build ways of inhabit that cares. So thanks, Maria, if you'd like to uh, take the stage, you're, you can go for it. Hi, uh, should I have to, to share my screen, no? Yes. Vale. Uh, one second. So just a reminder, you all have seven minutes to present. And then we'll okay. have it. Uh, mm, Do you see the presentation? It's not full screen, but we see it. But yes. one second. Right, right now, yes, no. Do, do you see? Completely? Yes, yes, yes okay. absolutely. Okay. Well, uh, thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, thank you very much to create these spaces to to create conversation about games, which I think is super important right now. Um, my name is Maria Tomé. I'm from Canary Islands. I'm part of the Civic Innovation Office. So before I start to, to talk uh, about what is playmaking and the power to become a caring city through video games, let me uh, introduce for a while my, my office. We are um, an associated work cooperative composed by five architects and urban planners and one psychologist. And we work on the development of better places to live from different areas, which are uh, cities and territory, uh, community health and care, cities and culture and networking, and housing and community. Um, we have been working playmaking, uh, in playmaking since, since 2016 in connection with the Civic Wise Network. And if you don't know what Civic Wise Network is, I recommend you to have a look in, in the website of Civic Wise because I think it's super interesting. But uh, since 2016, uh, last year, the ADA Commission asked to do more in-depth research to understand how gamification could improve the more active life. Again, if you, don't, if you want to know what active digital living is, you could check it out the, web, the website activedigitalliving.com. So uh, that was the, 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 the fast introduction no? to, to the context of the research. Where can I see the research? No, it's a good question. If you want to know more, uh, more about the research, you could check it out the, in our YouTube channel in case you, as I said, you want to know more. So I'm going to talk here, uh, what is playmaking and share a new idea, the, the citizen card. Uh, first of all, what is playmaking? No? Uh, playmaking can improve our cities and territories through game design techniques and dynamics. Um, but why we talk about games and why we talk about cities? Maybe in this symposium it's not necessary to explain because it's about this, but in others it's important to, to make a point on this. 
because uh, the 40% of the world's population play video games daily and the 55.7% lives in cities. And it's estimated an increase of 70% by the year two, uh, 2030. So uh, for us, we understand playmaking as the point of union between urbanism through placemaking and video games through serious games. This is, uh, could sound so simple, but uh, we make a big difference between play and game. To understand what is and what is not playmaking, it's important to understand these differences because uh, many times we confuse these terms and we call play actions as uh, things that are game actions. No, So play is an instructor or without objectives in general, and the only purpose is to enjoy or have fun. And game, in the other hand, is a structure with and with objectives. It has dynamics, techniques, and mechanics. So in playmaking, in this research, we focus on game. It, it is important, no? it's super important, this difference. So playmaking is the use of video games, techniques, dynamics, and mechanics to improve our cities and territories. And uh, let me, before continuing, I would like to highlight something, no? which I think is important. As designers, uh, we have a responsibility regarding the spaces we design, even if they are digital or physical. And not all of us share the same point of view of the designs that we do. So our designs can be generators of inequality. Uh, there is a super good example in a documental called Battle for the City, where uh, it talks about the difference in between two points of view of the same city in the city of New York, no? in the early 60s. In my left hand, we have uh, Robert Moses, which said things such as cities are created for and by traffic. And in my right hand, Jane Jacobs, no? Cities have the ability to provide something for everyone just because and only when they are created for everyone. You could see here uh, precisely the two point of view of the same cities and how this affects right now to the city of New York. So uh, playmaking uh, is composed of four big dimensions. First one is city, second one is technology, third one is playfulness, and the fourth one is civic engagement. Uh, many of these dimensions are already mixed today, and there are many examples of it now that everybody could know. For example, if we mix cities and playfulness, we have uh, playgrounds, or if we mix technology or civic engagement, we have civic data. Or we could also mix three of those dimensions. No? If we join city, technology, and playfulness, we have uh, augmented reality games, or we could have serious games, or we could, uh, could have smart cities and smart citizens. But the big difference uh, is that playmaking defends the idea of mix in the same place, time, and, and space, the four dimensions. There are some good examples today about um, these examples, no? Like the, the fan theory some years ago, or for example, the case of Pokemon Go, specifically not the game, specifically the, the social impact lab that we start a uh, uh, few years ago, no? Or for example, the case of geocaching. Those are good examples, but uh, of, of what could be a playmaking. But we want to share a new idea to support and improve the playmaking. Uh, in the Civic Innovation Office, we truly believe that there are new ways to do urbanism, not in relation to build more. We think that the uh, next step to improve urbanism is precisely improving the management in cities, which means uh, work with the, what already exists, because it's sustainable, it's cheaper, and, uh, and it's responsible. So the citizen card is an idea of a new management in cities with public benefits if you make actions for the common good. But what is a common good? All those actions that are necessary to sustain life. For example, uh, recycle, safe water, travel, uh, travel by public transport, actively participate in the community. And on the other hand, what can these public benefits mean? Uh, free public transport, access to, access to cultural events, improvement of public spaces, so uh, the citizen car defends the idea that we, could, we can improve the, the cities and we have all the necessary technology right now to implement it. So uh, it will depend on the urban planners, the programmers or gamers, what we, can, what we want to do with this and where we want to live with our creativity. 
So that's it. I hope I'm in time. Yes, perfect, Maria. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much for that. So if you can stop sharing your screen, uh, we'll go on to the next uh, presentation, uh, which will be given by Matthew Huber and Dana Kupkova. Uh, the paper that was presented is called Rocking Cradle, Interactive Urban Furniture in Pursuit of Environmental Attunement. Um, so if uh, Matthew and Dana would like to take the stage, uh, go for it. Thank you. Thank you. Um... Matt, Matt is going to share the screen. Um, I'm going to quickly introduce the project and then give him the um, stage to continue. So my name is Dana Kupkova and together with uh, Matthew Huber, we're based at Carnegie Mellon School of Architecture and our work is uh, situated within um, kind of a material science and shaping relative to lowering the carbon of upcycling um, the waste streams of uh, our human production. So the Rocking Cradle project is situated in design of interconnect interconnected play objects that want to care and tell stories. The aim here is really to provoke ecological intimacy between humans and landscapes through the mechanisms of play, curiosity, and stewardship while engaging local material waste streams and uncovering the history of soil pollution of a specific place. The project is set within the post-industrial landscape of Hazelwood Green, which is located along Monongalala River in Pittsburgh. Um, it is produced in collaboration with community that is providing kind of a series of inscriptions imprinted into the object in form of a plant graffiti as well as with support of our industry partners. Um, we're fabricating a family of 3D printed rocking cradles that will support public tree nursery as a community place and serve as planters, benches, teeter-totters, water and plant management mechanisms, and a kind of a form of urban furniture that seeks to entangle multiple publics, species, and landscapes. Matt? Understanding our invention, intervention within the site as another modulator of the historical process, we began by charting climatic conditions over time. The density of air pollution, soil contaminants, regional water flow patterns, surface porosity, and vegetation, with particular attention to radical vectors of change. This vast terrain, once occupied by steel mills, is being redeveloped by a consortium of nonprofit groups and private developers. Much of the energy surrounding potential development focuses on the tech renaissance of the city of Pittsburgh. Economic forces often leave out, undermine, and gentrify the existing adjacent underserved residential community, one that has been negotiating panoply environmental changes for decades. This mapping exercise sets out numerous entangled forces so that we may act upon them more collectively as a project. As extreme climate actions intensify, questions of public space will increasingly allied with those of planetary ecology and the boundary challenging expansiveness of ecological flow. Mapping can be a process of knowledge formation, but also a mode of form making. Past research from our team has focused on the capacity for complex surface articulation to generate microclimatic diversity, seeding potential colonization of surfaces with mosses and lichen. The project also carries forward technologies for mapping water flow digitally, this time figuring them into an articulated surface that builds up a visual intuition for the ways in which landscapes behave. This opens up several modes of empathetic engagement. The objects through their geometric performance can begin in a way to care for the landscape they sit within by cultivating new habitats. At the same time, their embodiment of ecological behavior seeks to provoke an empathy between viewers and objects, as well as viewers and landscape, inspiring stewardship and recognition of the situatedness of habitation. Here we can see early prototypes and scalar relationships with growing tree species. Urban play offers immense opportunity as a vector of curiosity and provocation of intimacy between humans and landscapes. In the vast interwoven complexities of global climate change and the inequitable distribution of resources and health impacts that cascade from them, thinking through communities that span between human social networks and landscapes and objects has never been more urgent. An intentionally ambiguous cradle-like form conjures a sense of the need to nurture, while the objects <clears throat> as independently productive vessels also establish their own autonomy. 
Ultimately, a nursery is a communal space, one that collectivizes reciprocal patterns of care and production. Their presence also must make evident a tune us all to the, um, <clears throat> to, the, to the forces that shape them so that we may all be empowered as agents to act within and upon ecological behaviors and the political, geological, and cultural forces at work. Urban play can intertwine itself with communal discourse and environmental consciousness. Beyond embedding productive surface patterns into the surface of the rockers, as seen in layer one at the top left, <clears throat> the pieces are also finely tuned to reduce material use and optimize functionality through balancing, imparting curious movements that add to the empathetic reading of the object. Seen in layer two, cementitious materials such as concrete, because of the volume used, are some of the greatest contributors to the global increase of CO2 levels. Two interconnected strategies are employed here to subvert that status quo. One, substitute cement with as much pulverized construction waste as possible while using bioplastic binding agents. And two, reduce the overall volume of the material through material specific shape sensitive component design by way of advanced computational optimization processes. 3D printing allows for these two strategies to dramatically reduce CO2. In layer three, we cultivate dynamic rocking behaviors allowing for play and also for the collection and distribution of rainwater. As we grow food in contaminated soil, we precipitate landscape to body contamination pathways. <clears throat> Rocking cradle intends to offset this cycle while using the body as a device for land stewardship, physically engaging body and object to intervene in local hydrology. Water can physically be emptied from a rocker into watering can cans, therefore bypassing severely contaminated soil. Nascent seedlings, too, can be tempor temporarily protected from contaminants in the sheltered hollow of the rocker. This makes clear the untenable state of the land while simultaneously recognizing a commitment to occupying it. The site will feature typological variation within the objects, cultivating a variety of behaviors that entangle the people with each other, with hydrology, and with different species of seedlings at different stages of their growth cycle. Depth of the planter basin, curvature of the cylindrical base, location of the center of gravity relative to the base, surface patterning are all design parameters that allow us to navigate the space of behavioral possibilities, as well as synthesize with different species. Pictured here is a three quarter scale prototype. The embodiment of ecological behaviors, autonomous habitat production, of structural efficiency, of stewardship behaviors, and of senses of empathy with and for the objects and their context allows the impact of these objects to resonate well beyond their physical boundaries, attuning visitors and community members to the entanglement of human landscapes and socioeconomic forces. They are their own community. They are in community with the trees they support and with the human social systems that intersect their use and occupation. Play as environmental attunement. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Matt and Dana. Uh, you're perfectly on time as well. <laughs> um, okay, so we'll go on to uh, the next paper, uh, which was presented by two of our uh, students from the Master in City and Technology. So we have Ricardo Palazzolo and Heba Catanani, uh, who will be presenting time, time uses space design, adaptable use of spaces based on citizen time use. Uh, so if you guys want to share the screen and go for it. So good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, we're presenting the paper Heba, myself, Ricardo, Kshama, and Marta, and this was a project labeled about free time. Uh, it was produced as part of our. Um, it was produced as part of our Internet of uh, People Studio at the MECT program, and uh, its aims in understanding the connection between uh, time and space. So, as we all know, the future is changing, and it's changing exponentially. Changes in the labor market, uh, market um, the work dynamics and automation has created new construct of time use. People now are traveling more, they are um, working less, and these changes have also changed our city. So can we imagine a more adaptable city to these time use? So our question actually we wanted to ask in this research was, how can we consider free time and the use of public space? 
Um, to understand that, we, we started at the individual level. So with the 24-hour cycle of a person, we um, took statistics from the Barcelona Statistics Center and how people actually spend their, their 24 hour of a day. Uh, they have these activities from basic needs to jobs to volunteer work and sports, so on. We categorized these time use into three categories of live, work, and play. And then we wanted to reflect, reflect these three into a spatial level. Uh, our study, we took the study area of Ishample district in the uh, middle of Barcelona. And uh, we wanted to test the methodology there because it's a central location. It has all these uses that we're talking about. So we took data analysis of land use and footfall and cr created this map uh, that, that actually reflect the three time uses into space. So we have work, live and play now in the urban fabric itself. The first here we have is the spaces of living, uh, which is most the do most dominant in the site, such as apartments, hotels, nursing homes. We have works, uh, uh, places of work uh, from administration offices, industries, shops and services. And we have places of play, such as parks, recreation areas, restaurants and so on. And if, if we aggregate this into a graph, we can reflect the entire land use of uh, the Ishampla district into a single barcode format. Um, we wanted to ask then, what is the future of this barcode? How can, with some jobs disappearing and some, some others changing, and people using their time differently, how can these spaces that will become obsolete and some that will be needed more can adapt later? Uh, we went back again to the individual citizens time and uh, understood that each person in the city has different uses of their time and different needs according to their job, their, their um, background and even their uh, status in the society. And then we understood we can aggregate in that sense their use of free time. So we have another barcode that can be generated by understanding this data. Um, and our platform or our project comes into the picture where it takes the citizens barcode of free time and the use of the, the free uses of the uh, spaces in the city and bridges the gap between them using this platform of free time. Uh, this platform acts as a dynamic machine. It updates itself in a constant feedback loop and the different times of the day, different times of the year, you have different uses of space and different people's uh, time changes. Yes, as uh, Hiva was explaining, we considered specifically this Eshampla district, and uh, we were considering some studies that are already talking about, for example, the future of office spaces, like for example, four out of 10, they will be gone, or also how the increase of uh, co-housing or new housing um, structures will like also change the, the concept of public space or shared spaces. And also another thing that we consider relevant for this case is the, the commitment of the city to reduce the transit inside this central district and how the reduction of transit will create more space for citizens, the reduction of parking lots. So how this all new available space will be, um, uh, let's say, available for public uses. In fact, also, um, we are not only considering within this platform like public spaces, but also private spaces that can host uh, public uses. So here we can see some of the examples considering the barcode of spaces. So how like empty spaces, for example, uh, empty office floors, they could become like spaces for yoga classes or other examples. So we are also considering like uh, private spaces with uh, public uses. We focus only in the current public spaces and also specifically in the case of Eshampla, we not only have squares and streets, but we also have this kind of uh, interior of blocks that theoretically they should be, they were thought as a pu public spaces, but most of them are pub private. And it's true that in the last year, the city halls has tried to recover some of them. Like I think around like 47 has been recovered. And this is an example of one close to Sagrada Familia that actually this interior block has been recovered and now, as you can see, is a playground. So we see that our platform could be also like uh, another like specificity of this platform could be considering the needs of these neighbors and then how, based on their time use and the needs they might have, this space could be designed in a different way. Like if there is more families and kids, a playground or more sport facilities, uh, basketball court, uh, courtyards or 
even if there are like a large number of dog owners, so more space for dogs. So how also the design could be really based on who really lives uh, facing this uh, interior of the block. Um, a bit taken by what I have, I was explaining about the system. We consider that not only uh, we might have like the citizen needs, as I was explaining also now, but also all the stakeholder needs and the opportunity of spaces, but also the municipality might have like some strategies, like for example, promote more green areas or healthy habits. So all these inputs could uh, like be uh, added into the platform and how then it could be a match of these opportunities of spaces and then uh, the new uses that can be done. And also we consider the platform as a dynamic uh, system that after like some uh, review and feedback, uh, feedback loop, all these uh, uses can always be reviewed and adapted based on the, on the new, on new needs. And just to, to conclude, we consider that um, this uh, new way of considering like the use based on time is aligned with the new ways of work and living since uh, like, yeah, all these changes might uh, unleash new public space and new spaces for public purposes. So how we can like um, use these spaces uh, how these unused or underused spaces with a flexible use can be more functional for compact cities like Barcelona. We also think that it's a replicable uh, project, considering just uh, it's requested like the, the right amount of data, both in terms of time of use of the citizens, but also the data of the potential available spaces. And finally, it's a powerful tool, we think, with uh, the concept of the 15-minute cities since it's going to give more like uses to like a limited amount of space uh, within the cities. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Ricardo and Heba. Uh, so we will move on to Tiago uh, Mindrico, uh, who will be presenting uh, Labirinto Urbano, uh, liquid, uh, ludif sorry, ludification as a form of civic and urban communication towards inclusion. So thanks, Tiago. Thank you. So the project I will present was developed from a master dissertation completed last year. The project was developed in the summer of 2019 and presented in February last year at the Faculty of Fine Arts of the University of Lisbon. So let us start with a brief introduction to the basic concepts that helped in the, the idealization of the Urban Maze project. First, the concept of ludification. Demarcating itself from gamification, ludification is a more comprehensive concept which holistically analyzes culture in its daily manifestations through the lens of play. It consists of acts of play, playfulness, appropriating the world and its structures to make them more ambiguous with eminently creative or disruptive potential. Uh, as Sicart points out, it is like a glue with the ability to aggregate various contexts, situations, behaviors, and individuals, extending play to an attitude of being in the world. Uh, it is present in several of the last century artistic manifestations, such as fluxus and acre culture, among others. Jane McGonigal, following question. What if we decide to use everything we know about game design to fix what's wrong in the world? Was a starting point for the current exploratory research by action, aiming to rethink gamification, game design, and its mechanics as performative media for a civic and ethical purpose. Uh, the second concept is the drift. Walter Benjamin, based on the lit literary explorations of Charles Baudelaire, pointed out the flaneur as an artist, a detective, and a investigator of the movements of modern life. Later, the Situationist International Movement makes use of these principles and puts them in the light of playful and resistant thinking, giving rise to the drift as a psychogeographic procedure. Guy Debord proposes the creation of situations as a challenge to our interpretation of urban space and in, in this way helps to cultivate an active engagement with the city, establishing an interface with reality to restore the social bond. A more recent example, awarded Best Design of 2020, uh, is the project of architect Ronald Ryle, Titor Totter Wall, installed in between the slats of the border wall that separate the USA from Mexico, this alternative playground, typically of the critical play, gives rise to a type of meaningful connection for the inhabitants, for the place, and for the world. The author claims that it was an idea about inequality, equality, balance, and the idea that actions on one side of the border 
have direct consequences on the other side. Based on this background research, it was essential to apply the revised literature and test its consequences in a practical ludic project. Therefore, it was used in arts and based design research process to create a solution for an identified problem in the city of Almiri in Portugal, the lack of urban accessibility. So these images reveals different problems where accessibility is at stake for everyone who wants to walk around the city. Blocked sidewalks with trash bins, electricity poles, lampposts, etc. Having seen this, it made sense to me to intervene artistically on this issue. In this context, the Urban Maze project is a first step for reflection and communication between citizens and the city itself. Uh, at the same time, the project invites participants to wander the city streets, practicing a playful, collective or individual drift towards a geographical point of their daily lives. Uh, the first image is the game kit that contains one rule booklet, five Ariad and threads, the MDF boards with five pieces of cut and thread, and one scratch card to scratch in case of victory. The game starts with the player choosing a point where he intends to walk. Players will have to follow strictly the highway code, and it's only allowed to walk on the sidewalks and cross the road in the crosswalks. No changes were made to the basic rules of civil behavior, as the idea is not to question the law, but to reinforce it as a critical voice. The idea of a labyrinth arises from the moment when the player found an obstacle on the sidewalk. At this point, the player can't pass by the obstacle. Instead, the player is obliged to go back and find a new path towards his goal. But the player is also obliged by the rules to leave a cut and thread tied to that object. This way of symbolizing a process brings a new way of communication component to the project. It is at this stage that it becomes public. After signaling the obstacle, the players back off in search of a new route, knowing that his mark has stayed there. This cut and thread, in addition to satisfying one of the main objects of the experience, offers a multiplayer and co-op critical, critical thinking perspective. Once the player reaches the end, they can scratch the victory card, which reveals the intent of the project. The message hidden on the card is as follows. Congratulations, you overcome your goal, you help others, and you made visible the obstacles in the maze that many face every day. Some mechanics and details were left unexplained in this presentation, but as a conclusion, I could mention the happiness of all the participants or the growth of the community feeling about inclusion and participatory public space design. Interestingly, the city, since the urban maze started, uh, has been transforming itself. Uh, in Bernardo Gonçalves Street, their garbage bins were removed and the pavement was finished. In the next example, the modification is not so radical, but it can be considered as an effort and acknowledgement of the problem by the municipality. Oh, sorry. Yes. Avenida 25 de Abril, one of the main avenues of the city, saw the lamppost, which was blocking the sidewalk next to a crosswalk, replaced by another one, metallic, narrower, place to offer more space on the pavement side. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks very much, Thiago. Uh, super interesting. Um, I would now like to invite uh, Byron, Karina, and Jan uh, Libu now uh, to present. Both of them are also MACT alumni uh, to present uh, their paper, Hexpods, a New Paradigm, so reprogramming public space during COVID 19. Hi, you can see my screen? Yeah, we can. Great. Uh, greetings to all of you, dear organizers and attendants. Our names are Byron Cadena and Ivan Libunau, and we are proud to present our project Hexpot, Reprogramming Public Spaces During COVID-19. We came up with this project during our master's degree studies in City and Technology at IAC in 2020. Hexpot is an urban tool that allows safe use of public spaces by providing a physical way to perform various activities while giving back the sense of public space and its usefulness. There is no doubt that COVID-19 has massively affected not only our behavior as individuals, but also how we use the spaces built for us. 
For Barcelona, we saw how the pandemic evolved from over 60,000 cases in the July last year to over 600,000 in the last report. This led the governments to apply a series of restrictions such as lockdowns, border regulation, and limitation in public and private transportation. The COVID-19 pandemic has tested the entire city infrastructure and especially distorted the general idea of the public space use. We go from permanent uh, in a new paradigm. We, were, we go from permanent spaces, which allows us to develop cooperative, productive, and accessible activities, bear towards intermittent spaces where emptiness, spontaneous, and intermittent as the rules. We go from simultaneous with crowds of people visiting attracted, active, and free spaces towards successive spaces where city recur to innovative tools and patent to ensure distance and security. And from collective, where spaces are productive with the promotion of various diverse activities towards personals, where spaces become exclusive, uniform, and quiet. In the last year, we saw how fear to COVID-19 has made us abandon these spaces to escape crowds with grave consequence for those who work it is based on activities such as cultural expression and street sales and fairs that now have been canceled. The methodology of the project divided in two moments. The analyze of site from obtaining massive data on the current condition of public space, generating a decision-making model taken from user and territory, and the implementation of a flexible, sustainable, and programmatic solution that meets the new condition to ensure the user safety and restore the attributes and opportunities that public space provide to the community. Jean. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So as for our analysis of our research, we chose Barcelona, Spain as our starting point. So we took here three steps for this analysis where we use um, land use maps and risk maps risk maps to identify how much spaces were actually affected during the initial phase of the pandemic. And then at the same time, with these risk maps, we were, we were able to identify um, which areas uh, has lower risk of contagion and high risk of one day contagion. And then lastly, we took uh, the opportunity to use real-time videos and YOLO3, which is a Python programming code and when we merged this together, we were able to identify that there are static and dynamic elements within a certain public space. So with these findings, um, it, these elevate, elevated our understanding on how people behaved and moved along the spot public spaces, especially during this pandemic. Next. Next. Can you go back? Sorry. So to give conclusion of our study, we found that we found out that there is a significant drop when it comes to the active use of public spaces and at the same time automobile use. Meanwhile, pedestrian movement and bicycle usage gained more momentum. And lastly, abandoned and unused spaces and places where there are high risk of contagion, contagion remained closed. So these results um, and outcomes really prove that this pandemic uh, has shifted somehow our notion of public space from permanent to intermittent, simultaneous to successive, collective to personal. So hence we developed the Hexpods. So Hexpods is a series type modules designed in a flexible, scalable, sustainable and programmatic manner. So it aims to generate new opportunities that will allow people to carry out activities in the public spaces without having to worry about the risk generated by COVID-19. So the first step is to identify how many people can fit in a single pad to ensure safety distances. And then, be, and then hexagon being a modular geometric form, we can arrange these pods into clusters according to what kind of activities are being done. Next. 
And here you can see now how flexible, how how we designed the hex pulse, hex pulse in a flexible manner in terms of use and location. We made sure that it can accommodate almost all types of activities um, that we used to love to do in a public space pre-pandemic. And then at the same time, it can be adaptable to any type of space. As for, as for performance, we designed the pods in a way that it will still bring comfort and convenience to the users. Next. And to make the hex pods uh, more visible, we made sure that we made sure to use lightweight materials and readily available materials. And lastly, one main key feature of our hex pods is the introduction of digital layer through its build, built in app where the users can book or schedule the pods. And at the same time, it can find necessary real time information of a place. So we believe that this type of integration to our project. Uh, is one way to create a more interactive and community-based solutions and policies based on live data and metrics generated by the public itself. Uh, COVID-19 is presented in the project as an opportunity to understand how important it is to have a responsive city. According with our project findings, we recommend the following concept, to design a responsive public space, promote physical activities, reuse unused spaces, thinking and design a master plan that consider inhabitants as a producers, thinking always in a mixed use in all of the projects, use the idea of proximity, thinking that the less movement from one place to another represent less contamination, less resourcing, and also less contagion. Thinking in a tactical urbanism always uh, thinking participative design and also the use of ACTs and big data to obtain knowledge from big data to improve decision making. We propose this project to give back the citizens the right to enjoy the public space and use creative proposal with a high degree of technology to guarantee the use and the access to new opportunities social inclusion, productivity, and security. Definitely, this new public space paradigm is not permanent. Thus, the return to a new normality has to be only strengthened by experience. This was our presentation. Thank you very much. If you want to see the full paper, you can scan this code and follow us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we will move on to, if you can stop sharing your screen, Byron, that would be great. And we'll move on to the next paper, uh, which will be presented by Sanapol and Osmana Firos. Um, the paper is entitled Public Human Design. Uh, thanks. Hi, is my screen visible? It's visible, but it's not full screen. So if you can put it in full screen. Okay. It should be control L, should be the command. It's not working, yeah, I'm trying. Just, just a minute. You have to share your full screen. Uh, so not okay. just the um, Yeah. Hi. Good. Uh, yeah, I'll start. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, our paper is titled Public Human Design because the center core value around which it spins is empathy, whose byproducts are co design and co creations, as we say. Okay, it's not moving. Uh, why empathy? We all have needs. Abraham Maslow established a few characteristics that are important in motivating individuals and steering them to behave in a specific way. Maslow's hierarchy of needs proposes how much you feel space, uh, you feel space safe in an area alone. Do you have a high flush of emotions? Do you like what you see? Does it make you forget all your stress and anxiety you have been going through? 
above all what is important is we humans are evolved social animals we cannot work live or survive in isolation it is our deep cognitive need to socialize make friends play talk dance and spend time when it comes to design the hierarchy of needs for design is little tweaked from bottom to up top first is functionality the design should work it should meet the basic requirements second is reliability it should work for certain stretch of time third is proficiency the design should stimulate an adrenaline rush in users make them do something more and something better and lastly creativity design should make people run thoughts and ideas it should make it should make them want to keep the gadgets away and think and feel and see what is around them now we uh, see throughout the history many public spaces have functioned as the epicenter of social life which allowing people to socialize celebrate play with their children and perform economic and cultural religious and political activities which we see in agora in greece forum in rome basilicas and piazzas are all examples we look up to we understood why human connection is important with maslow's hierarchy of needs most people have a desire and need to keep in touch with the rest of the world public spaces are crucial because they can bridge that gap public spaces is vital for providing routes for movement conversations and a common ground for enjoyment and relaxation people value green spaces they be willing to pay more to wake up to greenery and horizon every day they love nature and would choose green exercise rather than a mechanized gym which is the comfort of the place play time is very important for children grass and greens are very good for them it helps them build bonds and introduce them to people outside family and makes them learn about community which is basically a sociability you see old people chit chatting women sitting and knitting people with dogs playing and children having fun all these need a sensitive care about accessibility in the end basically all these are important and studies because humans have empathy co creation and co design challenges designers and users traditional roles moving them from expert based top down decision making to bottom up processes in which users active participation becomes crucial in co creation the emphasis is on generating a creative and open atmosphere in which users are acknowledged as creators the type of user involvement in the co creation process are involvement as co implementers co designers and initiators in co design users become co designers who can act as information providers creative thinkers and evaluators of new ideas considering science learning outside the classroom in an open ended process user active involvement is a cornerstone of all innovation in this area thus the project users play a key role because they will determine the scalability and sustainability of the project outcomes the idea of co creation and co design took a leap when local authorities got amazed to see that a young woman from a basti could design as architects or urban planners according to a coordinator in un minecraft has got communities to design their own public space in addition to their own free form fantasy worlds minecraft users have replaced every famous building in the existence including the taj mahal the white house and the burj khalifa this highlights the capabilities of users while designing their own public space now the categories of public spaces in this the number one is really limited public space which is clearly public in their use it means private leisure places such as private or communal gardens are independent from the city's public this needs to be seen that way a private property is a private property next is engaging public space in which designing in active uses next one is meaningful public space which is incorporating notable amenities and features 
In this, we can see the spaces become more meaningful if important historical or geographical qualities are integrated. Large screens, bandstands, kiosks, fountains, paddling pools, and other things, etc. And the next one is social public space, which is encouraging social engagement. In this, we should take it as a public discussion, protest, meetings, community experience, communication, etc. Next one is balanced public space, which is between traffic and pedestrian. In this, the mobility of pedestrians should be give enough room. They should not feel cage. Thus, traffic needs to be slowed down on roads that lead in and through public space. Next one is comfortable public space, which is basically a feeling safe and relaxing. And the last one is robust public space. In this, adaptable and distinct in the face of change, which means in the short term, spaces may be used for a variety of purposes and activities, maybe at different time of the day uh, in a week or in a year. In the long term, it means that changes in space usage or technology are successfully adapted to changes in locals. When we say co-design and co-creation are all user-centric, Co-creation as an act of collective creativity that is experienced and performed jointly by a group of people. Co-design as a collective creativity that is applied across the whole span of design process. This should be intertwined and be used all through the process from ideation to the final stage of design of public space. The suggestive approach is mapped below. We should not forget that how much ever educated and high accolades we achieve, no one knows a place better than someone who use it every day, lives in it every day, or grew up watching it every day. Thus, for an actual humane design, we must keep aside our architectural ego and listen and understand and debate and try to plan why, what, and how. Thank you. Please have a good day and stay safe. Thanks very much, uh, Sana and Osama. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks Thank so you, much. Um, okay, I will now give the word to Parichetra uh, Gudarsi, which I probably pronounced incorrectly, so I'm sorry about that. Um, and she will be presenting a paper uh, on behalf of her. So do we have her? Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm present here. I'm very happy this meeting. Uh, if you let me start my uh, project. Yeah, just let my me paper. Of, of your uh, paper first. Um, so the paper was presented together with a colleague, Mariam uh, uh, Mohammadi. Um, and the paper is called Holistic Real, Real Data-Driven Decision Support Tools for Integrated Building Landscape um, in Regenerative Cities. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Are you able to share your screen? Um, yeah, uh, I'm trying uh, to share my screen uh, and... Uh, okay. Uh, okay, we can see it. If we can put it in full screen mode, that would be great. In presenter mode. Uh, okay. Identify the relationship of a uh, uh, huge interconnected perimeter between building in black and, and block and the uh, public space in complex system theory with today's ordinary possibilities and limited human interaction with Simon called uh, bounded uh, relation, uh, relationality are impossible. Continuously use uh, current uh, tools and methods has made or intervention for changing and improve the built environment. Uh, less fruitful uh, intervention is not negative in the intervention that are far behind the speed of change in society. For, uh, for high uh, performance uh, architectural and landscape design in 21st century, we should uh, concentrate on middle scale uh, it means that uh, we should consider the design of urban uh, spaces and uh, uh, building blocks around them as a subsystem uh, of a city. 
and mid, uh, middle social technical complex uh, single uh, design issue. Therefore, we need more powerful methods, tools, and strategies to understand the relationship elements of different uh, subsystem of a city. Uh, and uh, as a result, more comprehensive intervention to modify and improve bio human uh, uh, natural species in collaborative relationship. Uh, which is in fact uh, the version, uh, the vision different in more uh, um, comprehensive uh, recent sustainability paradigm uh, like regenerative design. Uh, in uh, line with sustainability requirement, uh, requirements over the past uh, 40 years, we have developed many environmental simulation tools and building performance, uh, performance uh, simulation tools separately. Uh, they are based on uh, hypothetical data influenced by linear, uh, linear uh, problem solving approaches uh, and clean sustainability evaluation systems such as uh, LEED. Uh, considering the uh, public estate, our city, and the buildings with the discard boundaries make it impossible for us to predict uh, the quality of future urban spaces, uh, despite the uh, uh, speed of current complex uh, change. Uh, understanding the function of today's urban spaces is depend on the perception of landscape design and architecture as a, uh, interconnected tools uh, with the help of new real uh, based uh, database or holistic interdisciplinary modeling tools. Uh, based on rapid uh, advances in data mining and uh, artificial intelligence technology, now we could have AI-based integrated design decision support system uh, to uh, support designer decision in the earliest stage of architectural and the landscape architectural design. Based on real uh, data from the experience of existing uh, examples, um, like uh, existing building uh, uh, and uh, urban uh, um, space, um, uh, such as historical garden, and uh, uh, in a participatory platform for the effective present of all project stakeholders. Uh, that means a specific, uh, a specification of a system that the pool or two PhD on research, um, ongoing research. In landscape architecture, different uh, approach, uh, such as systemic design, uh, have been effective in shaping the uh, tools. Uh, this paradigm has two theoretical foundations, uh, systemic thinking and design thinking. Uh, architectural and uh, landscape architect, uh, architects focus on uh, system thinking, uh, rather than uh, design thinking. Uh, they, uh, they have developed the technical tools such as GIS and Geo design. Uh, and these uh, um, tools uh, suitable for um, large scale landscape planning uh, and not for uh, uh, and not suitable for earlier stage of uh, uh, the design uh, process. Uh, therefore, landscape architect, uh, architecture needs uh, decision support system tools for um, problem solving design and uh, integrated with the uh, planning support system tools uh, to having uh, integrated tools compatible with BIM. Uh, we don't have uh, tools uh, for uh, medium scale and small scale uh, in landscape. Uh, uh, we have three main challenges in uh, area. Um, lack of uh, transparency in how to integrate it in environmental design simulation tools. And the uh, lack of development um, opportunity data collection method for uh, formation uh, of data-driven decision support tools, uh, 
GIS in the digital context of progress. Uh, an only solution to uh, problem is uh, to rely on current uh, building information management methodology. Uh, um, for high performance building design uh, digital tools, we have to categorize both analog and uh, semi automation digital. Uh, digital. Uh, main challenge uh, in uh, area uh, is that relying on hypothesis based data from existing tools. The specific semantic uh, mechanism by which real data from actual uh, building and uh, public space affect the design uh, designers' cognition, uh, cognition are still now. Um, and it, uh, we don't have the full support of design process in the context of digital tools and the necessary compatibility, especially with the uh, methodology. Uh, to develop integrated DSS in regenerative paradigm, we must be able to implement three big steps. One, ability to extract big amount of data, uh, tabular, visual, uh, semantic, etc., under environmental, social, physical, and uh, economic sector. Um, sorry, two steps. Sorry, Chair. Uh, you're going to close your presentation now. Sorry. Uh, can you uh, repeat your please? You'll have to close your presentation now because you've already passed the time limit. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, to connect this uh, digital environment to various MLA frameworks in high efficiency space and the uh, uh, three able the entry of many existing sample into this process in an open and accessible environment. Uh, and uh, and uh, we uh, propose two framework uh, in uh, two framework uh, in architecture and landscape and uh, as a conclusion integrated uh, tools compatible with beam uh, based on this uh, this uh, framework. Uh, thank you for your attention. Excuse me for um, to no problem. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, so if you can stop sharing your screen, that would be great. Uh, but yes, yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So uh, now for the last presentation of the second panel, uh, we have uh, Nick Van Appeldoorn, uh, who will be presenting Pokemon Go as a productive counter space. Yes, thank you. Um, so I'd gladly tell you a bit more about Pokemon Go. Uh, Pokemon Go is a game we all know by now. And the reason I want to talk about it is because I think it's very important to what we're doing right now uh, towards the future. Because technology is getting more integrated with our daily lives. And I really see that Pokemon Go is one of the first big steps toward the direction of having a digital space everywhere. So let's first talk a bit about uh, technology acceptance. People are only going to use stuff that's based on technology if it's either super useful are super fun and it has to be easy. And I think this is one of the big powers if we look at the technology that Google's promote, uh, producing at the moment, is that uh, it's very easy to use, it looks very beautiful, it's all running really smooth, and therefore people get hooked on it. They are getting, they're getting enthusiastic about it. And one of their side companies, Nintanic, developed Pokemon Go. And this is really one of the first digital layers that was spread out all over all the cities in the world. That people were walking around, checking around, and I saw it myself when I was a student. When I lived in my student house, kid children were running around the building with their parents and students were walking with them. You really saw people coming together that would otherwise not meet, uh, and now having discussions together, having fun together, and enjoying themselves. And this is a very important thing. Because if you don't have a phone, you don't see it, but it is there and it's always there. Also, if you don't access it by your phone and therefore you can come in a situation that you walk with someone else in the same area and looking at exactly in a completely different world. Uh, and they are experiencing Pokemon Go and you're walking just through a park. You see people running around and you're not getting why they're running around. 
And therefore, I want to think about conceptualization of space. And this is a little bit more abstract. So as uh, Harvey said, we define space in three different ways. So we have the absolute space, the relative space, and the relational space. Absolute space is the space that is always there that you can measure, like with a GPS, and it's the same for you as for me. And I would actually argue that Pokemon Go is in this location. It is absolute space because it's always there. But this is the first instance of having space that you can see if you don't access it by your phone. And this changes how we use it. And that's what you do in relative space. That is the movement towards this location, towards the space around us. So you have people running around, walking around. And at one point I'm there and two hours later, I might be somewhere else. That doesn't mean I don't exist. It just means I'm moving, I'm living. And the relational space is about the interaction. So what we saw is a digital layer over a city that's always there, that creates movements and creates a different kind of behavior. And I find this fascinating because it's the first time not everyone can see it. And therefore you also get different usage of space than how it was conceived. And that is where Lefebvre thinks about. So he talks about productive spaces and counter spaces. And we have the plant real space and we have the plant digital space. And that is a step that was added later by Pokemon Go. So the, play, uh, the plant real space is about the urban planners in an area thinking, okay, people should walk there, relax there, sit there uh, and enjoy themselves there. And these are really spaces to stay and these are spaces located for movement. Well, at the planned digital space, you have a company that has nothing to do with the city, probably has never been to that location, is going to sit there uh, and say, okay, these are now places to go. These are places to move at, And these might be conflicting. And they both are put into place in the lift space. But then you have the lift space by non-players and the lift space by players. And they're behaving differently. And this can create productive spaces. And these are spaces that are used as how they were conceived and counter spaces. So spaces that get a different kind of usage than how they were planned. And this is a very important place when, it th when we're talking about placemaking. There are often the counter spaces that people use in a way and how they think it should be used the most. That is according to their needs and towards their interests. And now digital spaces can contribute to these counter spaces, but actually make them productive in their own sense. So you have people walking around through smartphones and they are seeing different things, but they can uh, work towards two different directions. Like on the one hand, uh, what they did in the Netherlands in a neighborhood during the summer, uh, they were afraid that people would uh, rob their houses. So the municipality actually asked Pokemon Go to place Pokemon spots in these areas. So people are walking around. So you have this kind of social control in the area to make it safer. But at the same time, people are walking, uh, walking around on their phone and passing through traffic uh, and are having accidents or are missing the red lights. And these are the things that we have to think on on a new level. And I really believe the play has the opportunity to do that. And this will be the, uh, will be the bridge between uh, how it was planned and how we will use it and how big technology will impact cities in the, fu in the future. But what I'm wondering the most about is like, how can we come from a game towards these kind of real interactions that people are talking again with each other, that people are wondering like, what are you thinking? What are, you, uh, what are the things that make you busy? And you can meet people through your phone, but how do you meet them again in real life? And that is something I'm curious to find out now and in the future. Thank you. Thanks very much, Nick. Um... So if any of the audience members uh, would like to ask any questions, uh, you can uh, put questions in the Q&A. Um, I'd like to thank all the panelists. Uh, we don't have very much time for discussion, but we will have a little bit of a discussion. Um, thank the panelists very much for uh, their presentations. I think it's we've seen a real diverse panorama of, of approaches within 
um, the aspects of interactive and community-based strategies. And of course, with the idea of allowing people to in some way shape their space. Um, so from more physical uh, approaches like that of Tiago and Matthew and Dana uh, to more digital or the interaction of the digital and the physical, uh, including Maria, uh, Ricardo, Heba, and many others. And Nick focusing strongly on the digital and its implications in our relationship with the physical world. Um, so I think that this has been really interesting. Um, and the first prompt I want to give, and I also want to give this because I saw that there were lots of <laughs> comments in the chat uh, within the panel, um, is uh, one that is a little bit more maybe uh, social and maybe sort of a projection on what you guys would like to do next in your research, which would be, uh, out of all of the people that you've seen presenting in this panel, uh, who would you like to go home with and why? Um, and of course, I'm not talking about <laughs> uh, setting up a love story with them necessarily, um, but whose presentation or whose approach uh, did you feel could really contribute maybe to what you're working on um, and come together and create a synergy that could allow a, a more profound or a more impactful project. Um, so I don't know if Maria, it's okay if I can uh, give you the stage because I saw you commenting a lot to start off this discussion, but I'd be really interested uh, to hear uh, everyone's thoughts on this. Hello, uh, bueno, um, congratulations to everyone. I think it was a super good uh, debate uh, about different projects. And, uh, uh, finishing with the ideas of Nick that Nick was sharing and also in relation with Tiago, uh, I'm interested right now in, as I said, in how to improve cities, not even building new things. Because we have a big challenge, no? Uh, we, we are the generation that we don't need to build because there is no offer, no? If you're an architect, you know this very well. So I think the challenge to the future urbanism is how to find in games the way to, to improve the cities by fixing uh, the management in cities. So that's why, for example, Nick says something super interesting. Okay, this is happening with Pokemon Go. Everybody that uh, study games knows, but the big challenge is how to change from this to this. No, this is the, the good idea. And I think Tiago resolves very well with the game. Uh, as I said in my research, there is a big mistake right now when urbanists uh, talk about play and games. In Spanish, this difference, uh, we don't have it because it's juego and juego. But in English, we have it, no? Play and game. So I think the, the future is talk about games, which has inside playfulness. So I think uh, Pokemon Go is doing this, but Pokemon Go, as Nick said, uh, I think they already know that they have to, to invite people uh, in the Niantic lab of social impact, which I think is, is the future. Big companies will, I think, will start to provide uh, social impact labs inside because they know they have a, a big tool and, and all the things to, to make change. So I think it's the way, no? how to interact people, not only by using games, uh, interact people in communities. In, in internet, is happening right now with the new tools, but in the physical way. Sorry, because I take a long, sorry, but I think it's the, it's the, the moment to talk about. Absolutely no problem. Uh, Maria, Nick, you want to jump in? Yes, I love talking about Pokemon Go. Um, you said like these are going to be the labs of the future towards social interaction, and that could very well be. Um, but I have a big if with this, um, because in the end, Pokemon Go is a company developed by Google and their main business model is gathering information to sell people more stuff. And that is also what we saw in Pokemon Go. You have these Pokemon spots and every McDonald's in the city is always a Pokemon Go stop. And that is not because they love Pokemon, that's because they love the Sahan burgers. Um, but at the same time, you have these companies that are super powerful, have the best data available worldwide not only spatial, but mostly like the personal level, the digital fingerprints that we give them to our phones. And they will know a lot about cities. And the next step are the self-driving cars. Like if we would invest the same amount of money in uh, environmental friendly cars as in self-driving cars, we will not have this problem anymore. The reason we are investing it in self-driving cars is because they have 16 cameras on board. The average Tesla are completely full centers. 
and where people go cars go. And therefore they can see the spatial world on a completely different level in a few years. So then they can combine that kind of information from these cars with our digital fingerprints, with this kind of exper experiments in cities on how people move around. And this makes them in a very strong, uh, very fast pace, more powerful than a lot of municipalities because they know what they are doing. They have the best data and the best programmers and the best tools to analyze it. I think that's going to be the next step is that municipalities are more going to facilitate the needs of the cities instead of designing cities. And technology will bring, uh, these kind of companies will come up with more plans because they're also generating business. So what I think is that we need a big discussion on how do we keep these spaces for people and not only make spatial games to sell more stuff like hamburgers, but do stuff that people really need. Yeah, I think uh, that's a really interesting point, Nick. Um, and I think also the the idea of, I mean, Maria was talking about like looking at what we have now, um, but the idea of also, you know, understanding how we can use these games to transition towards the future, to make spaces for people, to generate a kind of ownership within the space is very strong in a lot of the, the papers that we saw today. And I'd love to hear a little bit from, from Dana and Matt um, but also uh, Ricardo and, and Heba maybe on what they see uh, in that sense as you know this transition or this design for transition. I think our project comes from a very different cultural context when um, we're dealing with a post-industrial city and a degree of pollution and gentrification that uh, is kind of um, offset through this issue of kind of tactical urbanism and planting within the areas of a food desert. So it, 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 this idea of kind of a um, community being engaged, this is a process we're going through right now and kind of formation and inscriptions of the object that are um, being actually generated through collaboration with an environmental artist locally and a community center where we have actually kids participate in the process through um, the form of um, kind of co-creation and uh, uh, sort of inscriptions through kind of an act of graffiti that it's becoming more fossilized or not temporary, but more permanent that seeds both um, the, uh, the kind of an act of co-design, but also uh, connection to the place that's been taken away is, um, is sort of a slightly different concept. It's very, I think that, that this idea of kind of a um, big data bias that we're trying to avoid through using a technology and focusing on kind of a local ecological um, streams. Uh, that help to shape, directly shape environment um, and kind of take back the ownership of the space um, while using the kind of a bigger technological framework through uh, looking at material embodied energy footprint or decreasing the material energy footprint, that it can be prototyped towards kind of how we think about a future architectural um, construction. Is, is where our project lies and um, understanding that um, through singular creation of the object, we can learn and understand the impact that we have within a much larger scale, this kind of a cross scale relationship. It's um, really important to us. Um, so uh, the, the, the being aware of the, uh, some of the things Nick was talking about, the kind of a, um, tactics of a big data that take away the privacy while while pretending to uh, stimulate the community is in some way grounding some of these things within the physical objects and kind of a more direct local community engagement. I'm just going to leave it there. Maybe Matt can take it. Uh, I'll just, we didn't get too much into the context, but there's actually a massive Uber test, self-driving Uber car test site right next to our nursery that we're working within. And so there's this, I think, oppositional relationship between that, which is like the embodiment of gentrification for the existing neighborhood. And we maybe chose to rely on our kind of traditional architectural skills of object making to kind of counteract that. But I think it would be really amazing and interesting to imagine how physical objects that participate in the landscape 
scape can be augmented in a different kind of, you know, data, data scape. And, you know, I could imagine a sort of collaboration between the kind of work that we're doing and a, um, a, a maybe more kind of bottom up or, or totally different, um, yeah, politically oriented kind of gamification that, that could integrate with this kind of thing. I, you know, I, we definitely see them as um, there being both and potential, even if that's kind of not where we've gone yet. One other thing I want to add, there is this kind of a perpetuation of a problem through this idea of some of the, the way the community organizes itself around food production, right? For example, we're um, dealing with an area that soil is completely polluted. And yet we have the urban gardens, kind of community urban garden, this is a part of the solution, which sort of perpetuates the perpetuates the, the pollution within into the human bodies within the communities that are already endangered. So this kind of idea of that one has to have some kind of a filter or intermediary and how the and, and a kind of building the awareness of a stewardship, um, I think um, is critical through some form of a, a physical space. Okay, Davide, would you like to maybe make a, a point? Sorry. Okay, okay, yes. Uh, I, I have a question specifically for uh, Tiago because uh, he uh, didn't speak uh, in, uh, in his after session, so I won't uh, make him speech something. And um, uh, the question is about uh, his, uh, his game Labyrinth Urbano, uh, Urban Maids, because uh, I, I find that he, it is really interesting and I find that it is quite similar to uh, one of the, of the, of the games that we put inside the wiki, that is I Am Panel, uh, that is an infographic made uh, with, the, with, the, with the rope and uh, for me, it's it's really interesting if you can say something more about uh, what remains after the game. Uh, I mean, the uh, signs that people put inside the space remains inside the space as a as a as a trace of as a part of uh, of the game, or they are removed after the game. And if there is also and um, a, a, a classification of different guys that, uh, uh, th that play the game. I mean, we see um, a, a guy on, on a wheelchair that made the game, but maybe uh, there could be someone that is blind, someone uh, that uh, uh, is... Uh, uh, is, is, is a citizen someone that is uh, a guy from uh, from outside is a migrant and uh, maybe they can find different spots that are uh, um, out of these maids yes yes uh, the project uh, was developed uh, for including everyone and you can play it uh, like uh, multiplayer, not alone. And uh, the thread stays there for eternity if no one's cut it. Uh, yeah, but the municipalities start, start seeing the, the, <laughs> the project was developing, start cutting in some, in some spaces. Um, but, but yeah, um, it, it was developed for inclusion of everyone. Uh, and many entities here in Almiri, uh, like with disabilities or child or seniors participate in, uh, in the project. It was really interesting in this, it's a base now for my PhD student, student yeah. Okay, thank you very, very much. I don't thank know if there, is, if there is time for another question that is about, uh, well, I am really curious to, to talk about what experts think about Rocking Cradle and vice versa. Because in the end, there are two projects that works inside the space, adding something, but it's really, really different. Uh, I mean, the, the, the purpose of, of these two uh, things. So I want them that they can say something about the other project if they want.
Sure, David, thank you. Um, I, I want to talk about a little about the project of Ricardo and let me see Nick. I think they have a really good connection between our project because especially Nick's talk about how this digital level can improve the physical. So, and they use the data of, in this case, the cell phone data of provide for Pokemon Go to establish a new level of integration of, of the community. So in the Hexpot, we are trying to make the same with a physical interview, with a physical propose, uh, we try to keep persons in the same space, in a space that provides security also, but also they provide data. So I remember that we have one class that said that data is the new oil for, for the economy and for, um, for the world. So this information can provide not just um, data for the municipality to improve new projects in the space, but also to improve the same project that we have right now. So even the persons can be inside of the Hexpot and make a lot of activities. They also put their reviews in the app. So with these reviews, the municipality or maybe the private company that improved the project, they can start to develop more uh, activities and also uh, improving the, the Hexpots. So I think this opportunity to combine the information and a in, in a digital level and also the, the physical space is, is the future for the public space. So I, I found this connection between the other two expositions that I told. And ask you a counter question. Uh, we have time for like one little tiny more comment and then we'll have to. Okay. Uh, if you look at TripAdvisor and the top rated restaurants, that is hardly ever the best restaurant in the city because that's where all the tourists go. How does that fit into a rating system? Because it's often more for the, the big masses instead of the people who live there. Does anyone want to try and answer that? <laughs> Could you repeat the question, sorry? Yes, of course. Um, if you look at TripAdvisor, the highest rated restaurant is almost never the best restaurant in the city. That is because mostly tourists go there. So how does that fit into a rating system to improve a city? Because it's more for the masses than for the people who really live there and know the environment. Because the people who know it don't write a review because they went there since they were a kid. I guess it's the same for places. So how does reviewing helps help us to build better cities? Uh, I, I want to answer this. I th if I could, well, I think it's because uh, we design algorithms in the same way we design cities and are inequality. The people that design algorithms uh, have a point of view um, specifically. So behind an algorithm, there is a person. So I think the future in data is to give the data to the people. So maybe we could fix uh, this type of inequalities, in this case in restaurants, but could be, for example, with people in uh, wheelchairs, you know? So, so I think we have to open the, the data to the people because the data is going to be also a pro commun. There is a little bit of naivete in that statement, Maria, I think. One, and an issue with that is that um, it's about lack of accessibility, right? So if you're talking about a specific group, user group, especially related to the equity, the fact that these systems might not be accessible. And so it's a survey problem, right? You essentially have a survey and uh, which is a voluntary survey and the voluntary survey is answered only by people that complain, right? So this notion of how do you, <laughs> How do you actually uh, provide some way of communication that it's targeted towards the identifying what the problem is and what is the user group that actually you want to engage? And this issue of sort of an intermediary or a facilitator, I think it's, it's critical. This, the, the, I think that the, the notion that the data is unbiased or the system is fully accessible is flawed. And, um, and to me, the kind of a curating 
the digital systems and a gaming system towards um, specific community, which has a kind of a tactical spatial um, intention, it's, it's really critical. So I don't think that it, it's the issue of kind of a generic system, right? Generic system works to a certain degree and it can be become biased through this notion of kind of the modernist idea that anything's possible just because it's, it, it's accessible to many. So, and I think that, that uh, this is a similar, similar problem. Yes, exactly. I'm also leading a research project that's about digital inclusion. And you see a lot of people have very low digital skills. So just opening up the data will help us young people very well. Uh, but a lot of other people probably not. And yeah, I mean, I think we also have to be aware that it's not just the digital or low digital skills. I think with the integration of digital technologies, we also have the, the reduction of manual skills as well. Um, so now we're in a, in a very complex time where um, younger populations are quite digitally literate, but maybe don't understand exactly what it means to uh, interface with the digital interface. What are the implications or the replications um, in the back end of these digital interfaces? Um, so there's the whole hidden part, but we also need to take into consideration that this, this manual or this physical approach um, is also being compromised at the moment um, with this kind of emergence of, of an excess maybe of, of digital tools. So I think this is definitely something that, that we need to be aware of and you know, understand always how, how we can sort of be the most transparent possible, but also we as designers be humble um, in being aware of what are the limitations of, of the systems that we put into play. So what is the, you know, when we invent the plane, what is the plane crash scenario? Um, and be sort of very aware of that when uh, designing. Um, unfortunately, we, we, we will have to close this discussion. I'd like to thank everyone very much um, for the inputs. I think the projects were really, really interesting. We saw a really diverse kind of panorama of approaches. So I think that that's great. Um, I hope that you guys, I saw you were dropping your contacts into the chat. So I hope that you guys got everyone's contact. Um, and it's a pleasure for me to give the word to Chiara Farinea to uh, close up the symposium. Thank you very much and see you. Hi, Matilde. Thanks a lot, Matilde. Um, it has been two, two fantastic days uh, of exchange uh, on on our topics of the project, but we were also looking to deeper, like in this last session, to the accessibility and um, the possibility to really have access to the public space, to the data, to the, um, and what does it mean, uh, the participation. Um, I would like to really thank all the participants in this, uh, in this two days event, First of all, I would like to thank our partners from Buas and Clack, especially Nick Van Appeldorn and David Leone that were enthusiastic participants of these two days, but also to the whole project, given their expertise and their great support and ideas. I would like to thank all the keynote speakers that were participating yesterday to our symposium and today to all the authors of the papers and the posters. I would like to thank all our moderators of these two days that were a lot of people also participating uh, in an enthusiastic way and raising uh, very important questions to our uh, topics. And I would like to thank a lot uh, our uh, EU project team that is the main uh, uh, author behind this, uh, this uh, symposium, especially uh, I would like to thank Raquel Villodres, I would like to thank Marco Ingracia and Fiona De Mauer. Uh, for their great uh, organization and support and also all our communication team at IAC that was uh, uh, making this possible. So uh, thanks a lot to everyone. I would like to invite you to follow our uh, website and social media. We will place on our social media 
all the links uh, to the YouTube videos. We are going to publish uh, uh, the videos of these, uh, these uh, two days, so to make our discussion accessible to everyone. Uh, we will uh, upload the conference proceedings on our website, uh, and also this uh, we will communicate it, uh, uh, through our social media and through personal emails, of course. So, uh, and we are going to publish uh, in September the the book that will be uh, accessible to everyone from our website about the whole experience of our projects. So, and also this will be communicated through our social media. So thanks a lot again to all the participants. I hope I didn't forget anyone and uh, see you next time <laughs> and online. <laughs> thanks a lot, goodbye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, goodbye.